Chapter Fifteen of Lotus Buds. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gillian Hendry. Lotus Buds by Amy Wilson Carmichael. Chapter Fifteen. The Howler. Pickles and Puck at their worst, and both together, are nothing to the Howler in her separate capacity. We called her the Howler because she howled. We heard of her first through our good Pacquion, who, during a pilgrimage round the district, paid a visit to the family of which she was the youngest member. She lay in her cradle asleep. Pacquion kindled over it, like an innocent little flower, and she once opened her eyes, such eyes, and smiled up in my face. Oh, like a flower is the babe. And much speech followed till we pictured a tender, flower-like baby, all sweetness and smiles. Her story was such as to suggest fears, though on the surface things looked safe. Her grandfather, a fine old man, head of the house, was sheltering the baby and her mother and three other children, for the son-in-law had gone to Colombo, which in this case meant he desired to be free from the responsibilities of wife and family. He had left no address, and had not written after his departure. So the old man had the five on his hands. A temple woman, belonging to the famous South Country Temple, knowing the circumstances, had made a flattering offer for the baby, then just three months old. The grandfather had refused, but the grandmother was religious, and she felt the pinch of the extra five, and secretly influenced her daughter, so that it was probable the temple woman would win if she waited long enough, and temple women know how to wait. A year passed quietly. We had friends on the watch, and they kept us informed of what was going on. The idea of dedication was becoming gradually familiar to the grandfather, and he was ill and times were hard. But still we could do nothing, for to himself and his whole clan, Adoption by Christians was a far more unpleasant alternative than temple dedication. After all, the temple people never break caste. Once a message reached us, Send at once, for the temple women are about to get the baby. And we sent, but in vain. A few weeks later, a similar message reached us, and again the long journey was made, and again there was a disappointing return empty-handed. It seemed useless to try any more. About that time, a comrade in North Africa, Miss Lilius Trotter, sent us her new little booklet, The Glory of the Impossible. As we read the first few paragraphs, and roughly translated them for our Tamil fellow workers, such a hope was created within us that we laid hold with fresh faith, and a sort of quiet, confident joy. And yet, when we wrote to our friends who were watching, their answer was most discouraging. The only bright word in the letter was the word impossible. Excerpt from The Glory of the Impossible Far up in the alpine hollows, year by year, God works one of his marvels. The snow patches lie there, frozen into ice at their edges, from the strife of sunny days and frosty nights. And through that ice crust come, unscathed, flowers in full bloom. Back in the days of the bygone summer, the little soldanella plant spread its leaves wide and flat on the ground to drink in the sun rays, and it kept them stored in the root through the winter. Then spring came and stirred its pulses even below the snow shroud, and as it sprouted, warmth was given out in such strange measure that it thawed a little dome of the snow above its head. Higher and higher it grew, and always above it rose the bell of air, till the flower-bud formed safely within it, and at last the icy covering of the air-bell gave way and let the blossom through into the sunshine, the crystalline texture of its mauve petals sparkling like the snow itself, as if it bore the traces of the fight through which it had come. And the fragile things ring an echo in our hearts that none of the jewel-like flowers nestled in the warm turf on the slopes below could waken. We love to see the impossible done, and so does God. End of excerpt. These were the sentences which we read together. To the South Indian imagination, 
alpine snow is something quite inconceivable, but the picture on the cover and snow scene photographs helped, and the Indian mind is ever quick to apprehend the spiritual, so the booklet did its work. We have two seasons here, the wet and the dry. The dry is subdivided into hot, hotter and hottest, but the wet stands alone. It is a time when the country round Donavar is swamp or lake, according to the level of the ground, and we do not expect visitors. The heavy bullock carts sink in the mud and make the way too difficult. If a letter had come just then, asking us to send for the baby, we should certainly have tried to go, but no letter came, and it was then, when everything said impossible, that suddenly all resistance gave way, and the grandfather said, let her go to the Christians. We were sitting round the dinner table one wet evening, thinking of nothing more exciting than the flying and creeping creatures which insisted upon drowning themselves in our soup, when the jingle of bullock bells made us look at each other incredulously, and then, without waiting to wonder who it was, we all ran out and met Rukma, running in from the wet darkness. "'It's it! It's it!' she cried, and danced into the dining-room, decorum thrown to the pools in the compound. "'Look at it!' And we saw a bundle in her arms, and it howled. From that day on, for nearly a week, it continued consistently to howl. We called the little thing Navina, for the name means new, and it was our nearest approach to Soldanella, which we should have called her if we did not keep to Indian names for our babies. New and fresh, as that little flower of joy, so was our new little gift to us, a new token for good. But flowers and howlers, the words draw their little skirts aside and refuse to touch each other. From certain points of view, in this case as so often, the sublime and the ridiculous were much too close together. The very crows made remarks about the baby when she wakened the morning with her howls. Mercifully for the family's nerves, she fell asleep at noon, but as soon as she woke, she began again, and went on till both she and we were exhausted. There were no tears, the big dark eyes were only entirely defiant, and the baby stood straight up with her hands behind her back and her mouth open, that was all. But we knew it meant pure misery, though expressed so very aggressively, and we coaxed and petted when she would allow us, and won her confidence at last, and then she stopped. It took months to tame the little thing. She had been allowed to do exactly as she liked, for she was her grandfather's pet, and no one might cross her will. We had to go very gently, but eventually she understood and became a dear little girl, reserved but very affectionate, and scampish to such a degree that Chilalu, discerning a congenial spirit, decided to adopt her as her friend. This fact was announced to us at the baby's Bible class when the word friend, which was new to the babies, was being explained. It has four syllables in Tamil, and the babies love four-syllabled words. They were rolling this juicy morsel under their tongues with sounds of appreciation when Chilalu pointed across to Navina, and with an air of possession remarked, She is my friend. The other babies nodded their heads. Yes, Navina is Chilalu's friend. Navina looked flattered and very pleased. These friends in a kindergarten class are rather terrible. They are always separated, as the Tamil would say, if one sits north, the other sits south. But even so, there are means of communication. This morning, passing the door of the kindergarten room, I looked in and saw something not included in the timetable. We have a little yellow bell flower here, which grows in great profusion, and some vandal taught the babies to blow it up like a little balloon, and then snap it on the forehead. The crack it makes is delightful. We do not like this game, and try to teach the babies to respect the pretty flowers. But there are so many sins in the world, that we do not make another by actually forbidding it. We trust to time and sense and good feeling to help us. So it comes to pass that the worst scamps indulge in this game without feeling too guilty. And now I saw Chilalu, with a handful of the flowers, 
cracking them at intervals, to the distraction of the teacher and the delight of all the class. One other was cracking flowers too. It was Navina, and there was a method in her cracks. When Rukma turned to Chilalu, Navina cracked her flower. When she turned to Navina, then Chilalu cracked hers. How they had eluded the search which precedes admission to the kindergarten, nobody knew. But there they were, each with a goodly handful of bells. At a word from Rukma, however, they handed them over to her with an indulgent smile, and even offered to search the other babies in case they had secreted any. And as I left the room, the lesson continued as before. But the friend's intention was evident. They had hoped to be turned out together. End of chapter 15